I like you. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for coming today. <clears throat> for braving the slightly inclement weather to hear about something that I love to talk about uh, a great deal, and I love to talk in general. So that says a lot about uh, fishes. Um, and uh, this is a special Way Cool series, uh, not because of me, but because there's a movie after about half an hour of uh, my talk, which is really spectacular. If you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage you to stay and watch it because it can, uh, if you don't think that fishes are amazing and the greatest of all vertebrates, at least after that movie, then I, I, I can't convince you of anything. I can't think of a more pers uh, persuasive argument. So, uh, let's see. Here's the outline of my talk. I'm gonna first, we have to get some things straight. We have to understand what we think a fish actually is. And then I'll tell you a little bit about fishes and me. Like you may be, may be wondering how, why is it a, that a 56 year old man would spend most of his time or a lot of his time playing with uh, fishes. Then I'm gonna go through just a couple of arguments to suggest that fishes are the greatest of all vertebrates. Why possibly is that? And of course we're vertebrates, so that's saying something as well. I'll talk a little bit about freshwater, or diversity in freshwater and marine realms. Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about BC freshwater fishes, just a very quick overview, and then tell you two stories, the next evolutionary marvels in, uh, involving BC fishes. And the reason I'm doing that is because the film deals with fishes that are not found in British Columbia. And one of the points I wanna make is, as amazing as a lot of those fishes are in that film, you don't have to go to many exotic places, Africa or the Southwest Pacific, to study amazing things in fishes. Uh, then at the end, there's a little brief contest for people 14 and under, and then we'll have the, uh, the BBC film, which is about 40, 45 minutes. So, first of all, what is a fish? Who can tell me, young folks, name something that you think characterizes a fish. Whitfield, let's start with you since you said fishes are champions. When you think of a fish, what pops in, what image pops into your head? Uh, living in water. Excellent. Living in water. Who can suggest another one? Just bark it out. You don't have to stick your hand up. Yes, sir. Fins. Fins, that's right. How about one more? Yes, sir. Salmon are fish, that's right. But what, what is it, if you, think of a, if you think of a salmon, tell me a characteristic that comes into your mind. What, what trait or what part of the body or where it lives, as we've heard, uh, reminds you of being a fish or a salmon? It's red. Red, okay, so they've got color. Uh, anybody else? Yes, another one. Scales. Scales, excellent. You had your hand up, sir? Animal. It's what? Yeah, animal. That's right, it is an animal. Okay, now, each one of you guys answering that, get the fish collection sticker, which my assistant Jackie, thank you, will hand out. We'll stick with the fish ones for now. I have some other ones here in a minute. That's true. Everything you said is correct. Typically, they're vertebrates. Here's some other ones. They're vertebrates. They have a backbone. Typically, they live in water. Typically, they're cold-blooded. Typically, they have paired fins, pectoral fins and pelvic fins. They typically respire in water using gills, and they typically have scales. The one word I said in every one of those phrases was typically, because there are exceptions to every single one of those things that we classically think of as being characteristic of a fish. At the top here, we have a hagfish, which is actually not a vertebrate. It does not have a vertebral column, yet we call it, we typically classify it as a fish. Uh, this is the, a mudskipper. This is a fish that actually spends most of its time out of water. You'll see a better slide of it in a second. It has a jointed pectoral fin so that it can actually walk on the water. And the males incubate the eggs in air. But it spends most of its time actually out of the water. Uh, these are tuna, many tunas and sharks are actually warm-blooded. They're not cold-blooded. Uh, this is a swamp eel that has actually no paired fins at all. No fins, it's lost all the fins. Uh, this is a lungfish which actually respires air and can live for literally years out of water respiring air because it has a lung, does not have, some of them have gills, but this one in particular doesn't. And this is the largest freshwater fish in the world, the Mekong River catfish, which can go to over 10 feet long. It has no scales. So one of the amazing things about fish is they're very hard to define. 
And whenever you think of a single characteristic, there are multiple examples of exceptions to that. And the reason there are exceptions to that is typically because all of these things are adapting to unique conditions in the environment. And that's one of the themes. Fishes have an amazing ability to diversify and adapt to different challenges of, the, of their environment. Now, OK, so why would I be studying fishes for so long? And these are the reasons. These are some of the things that have influenced me in my life in my sort of pursuit of understanding fishes. First of all, is my brother's aquarium. Who here has an aquarium? Watch it. Watch out. You may turn out like me. <laughs> that was one of the early signs. My brother's aquarium, I looked at it all the time. It was like better than TV most of the time because things were always changing. Uh, I grew up, of course, in the 60s and 70s as a, a young person. Jacques Cousteau was iconic, and he still is in that time, the inventor of scuba. We watched his TV specials about the amazing variety of marine life, and I said, man, I, I want to be an oceanographer. Of course, I'm not an oceanographer, but at least got me thinking about science. As a young person, I spent a lot of time in Georgian Bay and the rivers of northern Ontario. This is me. You can't see me too well. Holding on for dear life going down the Montreal River in uh, the tributary of... Uh, Lake Superior. I've always been around water and rivers, and that has uh, one of the one of the things I like studying about fishes is it gets me near water, and I just love water. And of course, as I got a little older, these three gentlemen, Peter Larkin, uh, J.D. McPhail, and Norman Willimowski, showed interest in me and helped me sort of along my career and showed enthusiasm for me. And, and these guys were all champions of fishes, and that that rubbed off on me. Now I have three basic reasons why. Frigus moto Pisces. Fishes are way cool because of three basic things. One is they have nourished, fascinated, been revered, worshipped, and fought over, and otherwise interacted with the humans for literally thousands of years. I'll show you just a couple of quick examples of that. Number two, they're the world's largest or most important source of animal protein. That's amazing. I'll show you a, a, one slide about that. And really, they're so darned amazing as they adapt to life in water and air and as they diversify. I'm going to spend most of the talk, and mo the film is really about this. But we can't forget these two things as well. Here's just summarizing the first point in one slide. Anything from cave paintings of prehistoric humans to uh, depictions of Roman and Greek markets selling fish to a very thriving sports fishery around the world. In BC, the sports fishery is worth over a billion dollars a year. Uh, to This is a photograph of the famous Japanese fish market in Tokyo. Last year, or two years ago, yeah, actually a year ago, one bluefin tuna, tuna sold for almost $2 million. Yes, you can ask a question now if you like. Why, are it, why was it so valuable? Ah, because they're delicious to eat. And you can sell this. The tuna that sold for almost $2 million is about uh, 400, 500 pounds. Have you ever been to a sushi restaurant? Yeah. Each piece of tuna sushi sells for $2. You can make a lot of money off that uh, larger fish. So this is a very desired food fish. They're also getting rarer and rarer, so that drives the price up. And of course, we embrace fish in many of our cultural aspects. And this is just one, one example of that. Um, logos for two well-known sports teams, the San Jose Sharks and the newest Mr. Salmon Valley's box lacrosse team. Uh, there was a paper that came out about two months ago showing that Neanderthals ate Atlantic salmon on the coast of the Black Sea 45,000 years ago. Our interaction with fish in the most elemental way that sustains us, and people have fought wars over this, goes back tens of thousands of years. Now well, that is cool, if you ask me. Some people even get fish pedicures. You can't get more intimate relationship with the fish really than this. This is the doctor fish, Gararufa, that's used, people actually pay for this treatment, stick their foot in a bath of water, these little fish come out and nibble off all the dead skin. And there's been some con uh, controversy about the health implications of this, but still, this shows how we interact with fish in a very intimate way. Point number two, just one slide here. Uh, fish are the number one source of animal protein in the world. Every day, more than a billion people eat fish. Uh, this is a, uh, from the Huffington Post. This came out. This shows over time the increase in metric tons of farmed fish through time. And this is beef, right here. Last year was the first time that farmed fish outproduced all beef throughout the world. 
again, a critical uh, or, or an example of a critical interaction of humans with fish. They help nurture us. It's really the only animal group that's left that we still hunt for basic food uh, requirements. Lots of people hunt other animals, but it's not really for food. It's a, it's a recreation. Number three. Here's we get into more of the biology. Why are fish so amazing? Number one reason. Uh, this shows the percentage, or the numbers of fish species relative to all other vertebrates. There are around 33,000 species of fish. There's more described every month. There are more species of fish than all other vertebrates combined. Birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, and including us, humans. Why is that? So they're vertebrate champions, because there's more of them than anything else. One of the reasons why that meat might be is fishes are the oldest vertebrates. The oldest fish fossils, and I've got some really nice examples here you can come down and see later, some beautiful fish fossils, 125 million years old, 65 million years old. The history of fishes goes back over half a billion years, right down to here. This is sort of the geological time scale, doesn't matter what the details are. Fishes start way here. here. This is where the tetrapods, which includes humans, start here. And humans, of course, are only, modern humans are only 200,000 years old. These things went back 500 million years. So a lot of stuff has happened in that 500 million years to make them so diverse. Fishes are also amazing because they represent the most spectacular, not only the most numbers of spe things we call dis distinct species, but they're the great, they're the sort of most spectacular adaptive radiation of all vertebrates, and one of the most spectacular of all animals. And what I mean by an adaptive radiation is just a proliferation of different types that are all adapted to different aspects of the environment. And I've been reading a lot of Henry David Thoreau, rather strange looking fellow here, Henry David Thoreau, uh, and he wrote in uh, a week on the Concord of Merrimack Rivers in 1849, whether we live by the seaside or by the lakes and rivers or by the prairie, it concerns us to attend to the nature of fishes. Since they are not phenomena confined to certain localities, but forms and phrases of the life in nature universally dispersed. And what he meant is they're found everywhere. And they uh, show, demonstrate adaptations to those incredibly variable environments around the world. So that point here, in rather long sentence, is demonstrated in the next two. 70% of the Earth's surface is covered in water. It's a total bias that we call it Earth. We should be calling this planet water because most of the surface area, most of the volume is water. Um, and fishes inhabit and adapt to every single bit of it. And I've just got five examples, three shown here. These are snail fishes that inhabit areas like the Marianas Trench, that are 7,000 meters deep. These are Antarctic ice fishes. They're shown here uh, on top of the ice, but they actually live underneath the ice, eating algae and, and uh, other life forms that are adapted to the, sub, to the undersurface of the ice. Spectacular adaptive radiation in an area you'd think is totally inhospitable to animal life, but it's not. This is a Lahontan cutthroat trout from some of the soda lakes in uh, southwestern Nevada. And these lakes taste like baking soda. Typically, we think of a lake as a pH around 7. These things live in a lake that has a pH of almost 8. You taste it, it tastes like baking soda. Three examples of amazing, amazing adaptations to very different uh, environments. Now, here's two of my favorite, at least one of my favorite. This is the fish I mentioned before, the Japanese mudskipper. This animal is amazing. You can just barely see it here, and you'll see it beautifully in the film by Attenborough. It's got a jointed pectoral fin, paired, and it uses it to walk on land, just like a tetrapod. It has eyes that sit on little, almost like stalks above the water that are well, better adapted for seeing out of water than in water, although you can see in water as well, too. This is a, 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 an illustration of the burrow of an African lungfish. When the, during the dry season, these things burrow, create these burrows in the mud, and they respire air for at least six months every year. They build a little cocoon, they seal it off with a little mucus plug, and they sit there, slow down their metabolism, and then breathe air for months at a time. And experimentally, these things have been kept in this state of sort of almost hibernation for years at a time. And the rains come dissolve the plug and they slither out back into the, into the river. These are animals that are adapting to the fact that for large parts of the year, there's no water. That's why fish are so amazing. One of the reasons. Um, 
As another example of how fish adapt spectacularly to their environment, and one of the reasons why fish are so diverse and therefore so cool, is they're the first vertebrates to have developed jaws. And this is a very famous picture of the jaw of the uh, now extinct shark Megalodon that lived between around 2 to 25 million years ago, with these scientists sitting with inside the jaw. This animal, a shark, was over 60 feet long. And I've got a tooth that you should come down and see later from Megalodon here. Imagine 200 of these. Amazing predators of, of uh, ancient seas. And these jaws, you'll see a, a, a spectacular example of what the significance of those are. You think, well, look, look at, you know, if you move your jaw, your jaw only moves in one direction, basically down. Pretty boring. Wait, just wait a couple of seconds. Uh, but the, the evolution of jaws and the diversification of jaw types has allowed fish to adapt to a spectacular array of different food types. And here's an example. So go back to a fish like this that basically just opens its mouth up and down to a fish like this, the sling jaw wrasse, which has an amazing adaptation to be able to stick its jaws out away from its head like a set of jaws to procure food items. And a video show says 10,000 words, so let's just take a look at the sling jaw wrasse and what the development of jaws has done to a way in which a fish can feed. Isn't that amazing? The negative pressure, it develops a lot of negative pressure because it expands its mouth very rapidly, and that sucks the prey item in. Watch the prey item move. Actually gets sucked in. You imagine I had a giant bowl of ice cream across the table if you could do that. Your brother or sister would not stand a chance. That is, oops. We, you can see that later if you want to see it again, but it's, it's truly amazing. Now, uh, let's look at the biodiversity of fishes. When I think about, when you think about diverse fishes, most people, or where the most diversity of fishes is, most people think of a coral reef, which is fine because they are spectacular and the fish are spectacular and there are lots of different species. We should really think about things that are closer in our own backyard, that is freshwater environments. Because freshwater environments are per capita much more diverse than marine environments. And this is shown here. This just simply shows uh, the percentage area of all aquatic habitat, rivers, lakes, and oceans, that um, are made up of marine habitats. And these are freshwater habitats. Less than 0.01% of all the water on the Earth is fresh water. You go over here, despite the tiny amount of environments available, over 40% of all fishes are found in fresh waters. So contrast the size of this, this is the number of fish species we have of the 33,000 that are in fresh water. This is the amount of air area that's available to them on Earth, or excuse me, on planet water. What this means is that fresh waters are 41 times as diverse as marine systems on a per unit area, on a per capita area basis. So these should be reversed. I should have a slide showing these reversed. Fresh waters are amazingly diverse, and we often don't uh, acknowledge that. And there's various reasons why this might be, which I, I won't get into now, but I'm happy to ask, talk about people later if you'd like. Now let's go into just a, a snapshot of, so I'm sort of moving from the global scale to the more local scale. I want to talk a little bit about some amazing stories of BC fish before we see uh, the movie. And my goal here really is there's been a couple of other way cool talks about specific fishes. There was one on guppies and there was one on salmon. And you could have one for each one of the 33,000 species in my view. And I'm just trying to give you a, a more sort of global picture of why fishes are so cool. So this shows the different provinces and territories of Canada. BC has 67 freshwater fish species, which is about half of what you see in Ontario. So, uh, and Ontario has the most number of species. Quebec is slightly behind at 117 or something like that. But we're about half the species, named species diversity in BC is in Ontario. And there are various reasons for that that I can talk to people later. But mostly this is because a lot of the fish fauna from Ontario came from the Mississippi River Basin, which was unimpacted by glaciers and is the biggest river system in North America. So there's a huge area for fishes to come in. Um, some just quick facts. There are eight aquatic ecoregions. We tend to break up the freshwater fish diversity in BC into eight aquatic ecoregions whose uh, rationale will be immediately uh, evident in the next slide. Uh, typically, Vancouver Island has the fewest number of species, freshwater fish, 14. 
And uh, the Fraser River is the ecoregion with the largest number, about 42. And of course, there's considerable overlap between many of these areas. Um, we have a lot of fish that have been introduced from other areas by humans into British Columbia. That ranges from zero in the Queen Charlotte Islands to 16 in the Columbia River Basin. So the Columbia River, southern Vancouver Island, and the lower mainland of British Columbia are the most heavily impacted areas in BC in terms of uh, exotic and sometimes very deleterious fish species. And we are a province of fish immigrants. None of the species that we have, well, oh, there's a little bit of a fib there. None of the fish species we have actually originated in BC. Why is that? They came from somewhere else. Uh, here are the eight aquatic eager regions I won't spend much time on here. Um, I just want to mention that, so here's the Fraser, here's the uh, Vancouver Island, here's Queen Charlotte, here's the Yukon, a very tiny portion up here. Basically, I want to make the point that the sea, mountains, and riverscapes shape the fish diversity of BC. Freshwater fishes can't move from one river system into another unless they can swim down a river and up another river or into the ocean and up another river. So they are, our diversity is organized by the spectacular topography we have, the mountains, uh, the sea, and the riverscape, how steep a river is, that sort of thing. Now, the reason we're a province of fish immigrants is because 10,000 years ago, right here, that's where we are right now in the blue dot, this area was covered by a three kilometer sh thick sheet of ice. All the aquatic habitats, except those marginal to the ice sheets, which this is down in Washington State, were completely eliminated. So BC's freshwater fish diversity was scraped clean. The slate was scraped clean as recently as 10,000 years ago. So on the ice left, these fish came from areas that were ice free and that are beside the ice sheet, down from Washington, some from the Great Plains, some from the Yukon area, and of course, things like salmon from the sea. So that's why we're a province of fish immigrants. Everything we have developed within the last 10,000 years after living somewhere else for literally hundreds of thousands of years. And some of the things we study in my lab, which I'm not going to, don't worry, I'm not going to spend much time on are basically asking these kind of questions. What kinds of fish biodiversity do we have? How did it arise? Looking at things like the shape and pattern of glaciers. And how can we use this information on biodiversity's origins to promote its persistence through time? Just for aesthetic reasons, but also for very practical human reasons, interaction with humans. And we, we study ecology and genetics of fishes to answer those questions as well. Uh, and then, so now I'm going to home in a bit more and give you two examples of fish that are really cool in British Columbia. And I've entitled this part sort of evolutionary marvels in our own backyard. The first one involves these Amazon fishes. Amazon, note, are in quotation marks. Uh, this is work done by a former PhD student of mine, John Mee, the red belly and fine scaled dace. Now these fish are really weird. Uh, here's the distribution of the two species. So again, we're here, and they just get into the northeastern British Columbia. Their distribution isn't terribly interesting. What is amazing about them is that they coexist with, this, here's the one species, here's the other. They coexist with another species that consists of only females. And all the females are exact genetic copies of themselves. So what we think happened is in the past that hybridization between these two species, because of their interaction after the ice sheets left, etc., has created these all-female lineages. Imagine if you have a sister Imagine a thousand of them exactly the same as one another. Uh, and um, yeah, so these are all female hybrids. Now, what happens is these all female hybrids, they need the male of one of the other species to initiate development of their eggs. So we term this sexual parasitism. The female lineages, they require interaction or fertilization with the males of one or the other species to initiate development of their eggs. The genetic material of these other species is not incorporated into the eggs of these all-female lineages. The, 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 male simply, the interaction with the male simply initiates development of the eggs here so that they produce all female, all co complete copies of the, of the mother. And this is known as sexual parasitism, and they produce these clones. They're, clo they're clones. Yes, sir? Are there females of the, of the other gen of the other type that not have all the clones? Yes, that is an excellent question. Okay. So, in other words, these females are interacting with these ones, these males, and they're competing for the affections, if you will, 
of the females of these, parent, of these other species. So yes, there are females of these ones that these ones are competing with. They're stealing, if you like, matings from the females of the other species. <coughs> and here's an interesting thing about this phenomenon. It's a weird phenomenon, but here's an interesting sort of conundrum about it. All the clones here of this unknown species, unnamed species, they're all females. And fish tend to have a lot of eggs. They might have two or 300 eggs. So all the offspring of this female are females. And all of these females produce eggs. In the other species, there are males, about 50-50, there are males and females in the population. And only half of these offspring here, produced by mating between this one and its, its partner, only half of them shown here in the uncolored ones are females. So we call this a demographic advantage. These, the hybrid species can produce way, way, way ma many more eggs than can the so-called sexual species. And this has led to this idea that these are sort of an Amazon species. In other words, this refers to these all-female or Amazon warrior societies of Greek mythology that enslaved males uh, for various reasons, but they, the societies were dominated by females. This is kind of a fish analogy to that. So why is this interesting or cool? The re one of the reasons is, how does the normal species, if you will, how does it maintain itself in the environment given the potential onslaught of babies produced by these all-female lineages? Thousands and thousands are produced every generation to say tens or hundreds in the other species. How do they possibly do this with the, so many eggs being produced by the clonal species? And also the fact that the females, as the gentleman pointed out, young gentleman pointed out, the females from the sexually producing species are being stolen. They have less time to interact with their own species because they're fooling around, if you will, uh, with the all-female species. And, and the other way to phrase this is, why have we not seen an attack of the clones? How is it that the sexual species can maintain itself when all these things are being produced in such great numbers? And that's some of the work that my student did. And basically, it comes down to this argument, uh, or th th this, this is a summary of the evidence. We think they're allowed to coexist owing to a balance between opposing forces. This is represented by the sort of scales of justice here. Yes, the female species, the all-female species, has much faster growth rate. That's the argument I've been making before, that's going to tend to increase the population size. But John did a lot of work to show that that's true, but they're actually poorer at living in their environment than is the normal, so-called normal species. They don't grow as well, they don't swim as well, there's some evidence that they're more susceptible to parasitism, and also uh, there's evidence that the females of the normal species do not, uh, uh, sorry, the males of the normal species tend to prefer not to mate with these ones. There's some behavioral or morphological trait <coughs> of the all-female species that is less attractive. And that tends to depress the numbers of those things. We don't know if that's true, but that the evidence is consistent with this hypothesis, this idea. The second example I want to point out uh, has to do with the three-spined sticklebacks in British Columbia. Everyone here has heard of Darwin's finches, correct? OK, iconic animals uh, demonstrating uh, the sort of reality of evolutionary change through time. These are, could be arguably called Darwin's fishes. They are very local examples, as you'll see in a second, of the uh, action, or the origin of new species in action in over relatively short time frame. So here are the animals here. These, the males are on uh, the left side, and the females are on the right side. The fish on the top, the male here and the female here, is known as the limnetic species. The ones on the bottom, male and female, are known as the benthic species. And right away you can see, without me telling you anything, there are real differences between these two things. So the limnetics on the top and the benthics on the bottom. Name one difference you see. Yes? One larger. That's right. These guys are larger. And they're also, there's sort of more fine scale differences that I'm not going to go into, but they also have deeper bodies and smaller eyes and all sorts of other things like that. Uh, they live in lakes such as Enos Lake here, which are found in southwestern British Columbia. Uh, Nanaimo is right about down here. Here's Enos Lake here. This is Laskiti Island, where there's a pair, there used to be a pair, and there's a couple of these pairs on Texada Island as well. These are among the youngest vertebrate species on Earth. Most people, textbook, uh, or conventional wisdom 
decades ago was that species took millions of years to evolve. That's not true. They can happen in literally hundreds to thousands of years. And the sticklebacks in our own backyard have helped demonstrate how quickly new species can arise. Uh, just a couple of characters. Why are they called, that's a weird name, benthic Those are just fancy words for meaning living in the middle of the lake and feeding on plankton or feeding in the near, the, the sort of uh, literal or near shore area of the lake, they're called benthics. And here's another example of the differences in size. These are different gill raker numbers. Gill rakers are little bony projections on the inside of the uh, head that helps um, accumulate food items in the water column. Fish that feed on plankton, these guys, tend to have more. They're about 25. Fish that feed on large bodied items on the, in the sort of near shore area tend to have fewer. So they're morphologically and behaviorally very distinct living together. They don't breed with each other if you can do experimental manipulations, etc. And they're genetically different. And that's exactly the definition of what a biological species is. These are two distinct biological species that have arisen within 10,000 years in our own backyard. Now, just to emphasize the final point, the, this is the, the world. The purple outline shows the distribution of three-spine sticklebacks, which this fish basically is, is found throughout the world in uh, areas that are near shore or uh, coastal lakes and streams um, that are near to the ocean coast. The, despite this broad distribution of the typical stickleback here, the only place the two species are found living in the same lake is right in our own backyard. Now, why, that does not seem strange to you. Why would that be? Clearly, they have the potential to exist throughout the world if there's only one place that they do. And that makes our own backyard incredibly special, just because these fish are found here, but also for the study of the origin of new species. Here's a distribution in a bit more uh, detail. Here's Vancouver Island. Here's Vancouver. Uh, the blue dots represent the location of current populations. And the red dots indicate locations of populations of these two species that have gone extinct for various reasons, which is the subject of a whole other presentation. The gray shading represents the extent to which coastal British Columbia was flooded by the sea when the glaciers left 10,000 years ago. So all the sticklebacks that we see in the lakes, and there's hundreds of them around here, came ultimately from colonists that stem from fish that were living in the sea when the glaciers were here. And the way we think they did this is because, so the, go, go back to the question, why is it only in British Columbia, though? What's so special about British Columbia that we get these two species recently evolved 10,000 years only in British Columbia, despite the, wide, the worldwide occurrence of the typical three-spine stickle back here? It's because British Columbia was subject to two invasions from the sea when the glaciers left. And that's unique to this area. <clears throat> and here's how this sort of idea works. So we're starting back here, sort of back in time 10,000 years ago. The, uh, this is a, symbolizing a lake, and this is symbolizing the sea. The typical marine stickleback, the, the ice sheets left, the sea flooded in, as I showed in the last talk. The sticklebacks flooded in and colonized near shore areas. The land rebounded up, lakes formed, and the sticklebacks got stuck in these lakes. This happens, has happened all around uh, the northern hemisphere and in parts of the southern hemisphere as well. So these lakes are now isolated and through time this so-called benthic form evolves, the form that loves to feed on big items in, the, near sh in the, the, the areas close to the shore. And the reason they do that is most lakes tend to take this form that have only one stickleback in them. Almost all of them are this form. That's because the benthic area the, the near shore area has lots of food items that are big and energy rich. So fish typically by default tend to go there. You want to go where the most food is. We have really good geological evidence that there was a second invasion from the sea a couple of thousand years later. So what this did was it eliminated the barrier between lakes and the sea, allowing, because there's literally billions of sticklebacks still living now in the ocean. This allowed a second invasion into the lakes but only lakes that were subject, that were a, of a suitable elevation that could allow two invasions. But this fish comes into the lake. It sees the lake already occupied by this benthic fish that has been in there for a couple of thousand years and is well adapted to living in lakes. So what it does is it adapts to an alternative niche, which is or, or turtle, uh, alternative habitat, which is the middle part of the lake where the plankton are. And they compete for shared food resources. And eventually what you get is this fish adapts even more to the, to the big food items. This fish, now known as the lamedic, adapts to the planktonic food items in the middle of the lake. 
And what we see is the contemporary observation of the lake. We have a benthic type and a lamedic type. And the reason, and there's lots of people have studied this, including myself, but many other people as well. The reason this is amazing is because it shows that species can evolve in a relatively short time period. And it also highlights how the geography of the area is so important to trying to understand why certain areas have some species and certain or a number of species in other areas have fewer or different kinds of species. You can't understand that unless you understand the geographic context. The habitat that the fish lives in is crucial to understanding how they evolved and how they can persist through time. So why is this cool? Well, it's made in BC diversity. These are species that occur in British Columbia and nowhere else in the world for the reasons I just explained. They're unnamed, and this is known, so they're, they act like biological species, but they're all, for, for reasons that might sound a bit confusing, but uh, we're not going to get into it now, they're still called by the same scientific name. And this is known as the Linnaean shortfall. Linnaeus developed the way in which we name things. These two things are called the same thing, but they're clearly different. So we're not accounting for the diversity using the taxonomy properly. Uh, it also illustrates the key role of ecology in driving species origin and persistence. These things will not exist in the future if the habitats they live in are not maintained as well. You can't have these fish without the habitat. It also illustrates the repeatability of evolution driven by the environment. I, there are five lakes where this has occurred. So there's an argument by some people thinking every time you rewind the tape of life, you're going to get different animals and plants. This is data or studies, uh, information that directly counteracts that. Similar environments tend to produce similar things. Uh, and again, in environmental integrity, the, the health of the environment, is key to allowing these things to persist through time. Okay, so final thoughts, just as a summary of everything I've sort of talked about. Uh, fishes are so diverse because they're really old. Remember, they're half a billion years old. And they have this amazing ability to adapt to the incredible range and extent of habitats that they live in. Water constitutes 70% of the Earth's surface and fish have adapted to every single bit of it. That's why there's so many of them. In the British Columbia context, we have a relatively low diversity of formally described species. Brazil has literally thousands of freshwater fish species. BC has 67. However, as I've just talked in the last bit, BC's diver diverse topography and the fact that we've had the sea, we've had glaciers, we have mountain building, etc., has promoted tremendous diversity within what we normally think is a single named species. And this is known as cryptic diversity. There's a lot of cryptic diversity. We haven't quite yet figured out how to hang a name on. Uh, and the maintenance of this diverse and functional waterscape, as I like to call it, is crucial to their persistence through time. You can't have this amazing stuff we have in BC unless the habitat these fish live in is maintained. Ah, forget all what I just said. Well, don't forget it all. But this summarizes, I think, even better. Frigus moto Pisces, obviously, because of this little ditty. Mother Nature enjoys all she's done, but the fishes were likely most fun. If she had not adored them, but rather abhorred them, she'd simply have stopped at just one. Clearly, that's not true. That's why fishes are so amazing. Uh, I borrowed this from a, a book on rock fishes, which are a whole other, other story. But those are some of the reasons why I think fishes are amazing from a very general uh, context and also within a British Columbia context. And the film will now explore way better than I can just some amazing adaptations, things you won't believe fish can actually do in the film. Now, while that gets set up, uh, I do have a contest. I guess it's just going to take a second, so I just might as well do the contest. Okay, who knows, okay, this, you have to be 14 or under, and no using social media. Who can tell me what the provincial fish of British Columbia is? Yes, sir. Salmon? That's right. You get the salmon poster. Uh, as a follow-up question, do you know how many species there are in BC? Five? That's right. I'm sorry, but you don't get this. Uh, okay, who can tell me what the biggest fish in the world is? The longest. I believe your hand was up first. That was close, though. Yes? You're right. You get the second post. What? What? Uh, that's a big one, too. But the whale fish is longer. What? Blue shark. 
Whale, whale shark. shark. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, they even get. Yeah, that's very good. They even get a bit longer. But don't worry because your hand is up so soon. This there. Okay, let's, let's stop this baby. Here, I'm going to give you some. Po some well, why don't you come up after and you can get your pick of stickers, okay? Okay. Cool. Um, and right. Let's see. Have I forgotten anything else? I uh, don't believe so. Uh, hopefully, at the end of the film, I'm available to answer any questions you have. Please make sure you come up and look at some of these things. This is a, I should, I should mention these just quickly. This is a sawfish bill from the Gulf of Mexico. This fish, I put it here because, uh, so of course this is, it's an extended rostrum, the nose part. And you can come up and certainly touch this and feel the teeth, it's like a chainsaw. And this fish moves it back and forth like this to stun or impale fish and shakes them off and eats them and it uses it to dig in the sand. This fish, the total length would have been up to that wall. And this would easily take your leg off at the end of the wall. Uh, it would easily take your leg off if it was swung. It's very heavy. This is a megalodon tooth. Again, that's from a, uh, this huge shark, shark over, up to 60 feet long. Mm -hmm. This was uh, actually given to me by a student in my fish class this year. It's um, a beautifully preserved fossil. It's 125 million years old. You don't get to see things that old. It's beautifully preserved. It's, it's mind-blowing to think that that is that old. Uh, this is spectacular, just from an, if nothing else, from an artistic point of view. This is a fish fossil from the Green River Formation, very famous in Wyoming. It's about 60 million years old. So come and take a look at that. It's a fossil, yes, sir. Like yes, sir. It does. It's so perfectly preserved. It's definitely a fossil. Uh, and this is a chum salmon skull. Um, I found this while I was fishing on the Squamish River several years ago, and was just sitting there in the sand. Dusted away, it's perfectly preserved. So please come and take a look at some of these examples of why fishes are cool. And I hope you enjoy the movie. But I have lots of time if you want to talk about stuff after after the movie.